I have probably 40 sweaters worth of yarn, but I'm just limited by time like all other adults. I can't get rid of that. I might need it again someday. And if I do, I don't have enough money to replace it. Recently, my mom passed away and she had collections. I want to try to recover money from these collectibles, but I can't seem to find the right people or place to sell them. I feel that my children, they're ages five to 15. They sometimes don't seem to place value on things. And I do believe it's because of excess. Welcome to the Minimal Mom Podcast where simplicity meets inspiration on your journey to a clutter-free and intentional life. Join us each week as we dive into practical tips, real-life stories, and expert interviews to guide you through the art of decluttering. Let's declutter our homes, minds, and lives together. This is the Minimal Mom Podcast. My question is that I am an avid crafter. I do all kinds of crafts, and that means that I have probably 40 sweaters worth of yarn, maybe 40 garments worth of fabric, and many other things. The hardest thing for me to declutter are these objects because I feel like at some point I will get them done. And I'm not a crafter that doesn't do what I set out to do, but I'm just limited by time like all other adults. The truth is that I probably cannot do all of the crafts I have supplies for if I really want to be honest with myself. So this may be a difficult one for you if you're not a super crafter, but I would love some advice on how to let some of it go. Thank you so much. Jenny, this is such a good question. And I used to do a lot more crafting than I do now, but I just spent the weekend. We had our minimalism masterclass. And at one point we did a breakout room for women that were specifically working on craft rooms because um, there was many that said they were. So I have to spend about 45 minutes with a group of 35 women all working through craft supplies. And here's a few things that we talked about and that we arrived at. One, almost everybody had more craft supplies than hours in the day. So there is something about being realistic about how much time you have and how much you could actually get done. We also talked about, and everyone seemed to agree, that they get overwhelmed when they have too many supplies and sometimes feeling like their supplies aren't well organized or that there's just too much inventory keeps them from doing their crafts and often they feel torn between cleaning and organizing their craft room and actually doing the crafts and many in the group that had already significantly decluttered their crafts were encouraging the others you don't realize what a weight you're lifting off your shoulders when you let some of this stuff go. And it's twofold. One, it's extra inventory that we have to manage. But also the second is that usually there's a lot of guilt that comes along with maintaining these large inventories of craft supplies. We all know it, it represents a lot of money invested. And we feel like the only way to make good on this investment is to complete the craft project. And so these craft supplies, they don't feel like this valuable asset like look at this wonderful library of yarns and fabrics that I have. We see these projects, these unfinished projects that the only way we're going to justify all this money we spent on these supplies is if we complete them. And so there is a lot of freedom found when we're willing to let go of a certain amount, when we know it's more than we'll ever possibly get to, or when we recognize that it's certain craft supplies for things that we no longer desire to do. Over the last 20 years with the invention of Pinterest and everything, it's never been easier to find ideas for different crafts to do. Even for those who do um, knitting, crochet, quilting, now there's just like so many more options out there of, of patterns you can get and different variations you can do. And so it feels like the the world of crafts has just exploded and expanded so much. And you know, it's not wrong that many of us experimented with different things. We're like, oh, I'll try that. Or we had a friend that got into something and, or they hosted a party like stamping up. And then we went and we're like, oh, we'll get some stamps. So you can't just get one stamp set. You have to get the paper and the coordinating cardstock and the embellishments and everything else that goes with it. And so many of us have found ourselves, whether you're like Jenny and you're 
sell the things that you make and you're near professional or you're just a hobbyist, we've found ourselves with these massive inventories of supplies that we would never possibly have enough hours in the day to get to. So this is where you absolutely have permission to let a bunch of this go. And so we begin to prioritize. When I have extra time, what projects do I get excited about finishing? Which ones would I look forward to doing and completing? And which ones have I, they they don't interest me anymore. And I've, I've moved on from that craft or that style of thing. And if you will be willing to let that stuff go, I think you too are gonna find so much freedom in your craft room and you are gonna be much more likely to do the crafts and to enjoy the crafts. And one other thing we talked about in our group too is that many women said that they really enjoyed doing these crafts with other people. I know that's the case for my mom and, and her stamping. She is happiest when she's doing it with others. Now, she's significantly pared down the amount. I should ask her how much she's gotten rid of because at least 50%, I would have to imagine, of her stamping and paper and embellishments and all the stuff that goes along with it. She's at least downsized by 50% and she enjoys it so much more. I mean, most days when we go over there, she has some kind of project out on the dining room table, but she also loves opportunities to go and do it with other women as well. And one friend in the group said that she's a quilter. And so she has a standing date with one of her friends and one once a month for six hours, I think it was six, but many hours, they they quilt virtually together. So they go on FaceTime and they're both quilting and visiting and showing each other what they're working on. And I just thought that was so cool. And I love that we have all these options now that we can do this virtually and in person. But often our inventory keeps us from enjoying this with others as well. So you might also find that as you reduce the inventory of your crafts, not only are you more likely to complete projects, but you're also more likely to invite others into it as well, which is really enjoyable. Um, uh, hey, Dawn, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but this might be a good time to mention that enrollment is open for the Take Your House Back course and the next all day to clutter. The course consists of 24 videos with guided decluttering and instruction that you can watch at your own pace. But the real magic happens during the all-day declutters that are included with your enrollment. These events take place multiple times throughout the year and are a full day of live guided decluttering. You'll feel motivated and inspired as you declutter alongside thousands of other people. You can find all the details in the description or visit TakeYourHouseBack.com. And now back to you, Don. I would love to hear any advice you have for decluttering when you're on a tight budget. When I go to declutter, I start having thoughts like, oh no, I can't get rid of that. I might need it again someday. And if I do, I don't have enough money to replace it. And then I kind of get stuck. Well, Rachel, I think you just asked the number one question when it comes to decluttering because most most people don't have extra budget to replace the things. So, oh, I have so many things <laughs> I want to say around this. Okay. Um, so again, we just hosted our Minimalism Masterclass this past weekend, and I got to co-host it with Zoe Kim from Raising Simple. And she's lived as a minimalist. I think she said she figured like 13 years now. And she said that is the biggest hurdle is when you get to the point where you are getting rid of perfectly good things. And what's fascinating about it is we were just in Mexico um, last week on a mission trip. So it was the second time that we had been down there. And it's really interesting. If you've ever had an experience of going to another country where they don't have the same comforts that we do here, or even honestly, a lot of times it feels like when we go camping, but you leave a lot of your luxuries at home, your extra things, your variety, and um, you just kind of go with the bare minimum. When we came back, one of the things that, that struck me the most was how quickly we adapted to not having all of these things. Actually, how freeing it was to have just very small selection of clothing to wear and um, just not have to worry about managing so much things. And the kids, the kids played all week with like one ball, I think all of them together, right? They had a jump rope made out of a piece of literal rope, not even an actual jump rope. It Such minimal things. They were um, doing stuff with rocks and I don't even know. I, it was just, it was fascinating. And I came home thinking about how uh, po poverty is not the solution, right? Poverty leaves us um, 
wanting things and not having enough. Like that is, I'm in no way saying that that is the solution, but overabundance brings its own set of problems. And I think where we feel most at home is actually closer to having way less than it is to all of this abundance. And so when we're surrounded by all of this stuff and we're thinking about decluttering it, it does feel very unsettling to think, but what if I need it? What if, what if, and I I couldn't just go out and buy it again. But my encouragement to you is that I don't think you're going to miss it. I I came home from an experience like this saying, wow, I want to go even further with some simplifying our house. What am I hanging on to this extra stuff for? Who needs it? Because this stuff is not what brings us joy, fulfillment. What, what was so fulfilling about that trip was one, getting to help other people, making a difference in someone else's life. And we don't have to go to another country to be able to do that, right? We can do it right here with our neighbors and other people around us. Um, it was living in close community with people for a week. It was so fun spending a week with these other families, having meals together, working together, serving together. It was so enjoyable. And how often does the stuff and the clutter in our homes keep us from having others over and doing life together and inviting other moms over and having play groups at our house or doing a book study just for fun? How often does all of our extra stuff keep us from that? And then we forget that we all have creativity, both in the in the way that if we don't have something we need, we just think of something else to use. I mean, you see, we saw so much creativity in Mexico, like so many things that it was like, that's not what that was designed to be used for, but wow, that works perfectly well, <laughs> right? But also in filling our time that, you know, kids especially, they don't need lots of toys or craft supplies. Give them the bare necessities and they thrive. They get to use their imaginations. And as adults, we actually like to do that too. So I don't think we have to worry so much about getting rid of things that we might possibly need. I think the bigger worry is that we don't get our houses decluttered and we don't get them simplified and we never get to experience the joy and the freedom of living with so much less. I mean, one of the reasons I feel like our family could even go on a trip like this is because we have highly simplified and decluttered and have really prioritized where we put our finances now. And so we can do something like this. I don't know if we still had all the clutter and all the things and our schedule was cluttered the way it was that we would have ever elected to do something like this. So I think the bigger thing we should worry about is continuing to be surrounded by things that we're not actually using that aren't actually adding value to our lives and not so much the concern about getting rid of something we might need. Now, lastly though, um, the minimalists have the 2020 rule that says when you are decluttering your house, if you find something you hold it up and you have not used it in the, I think they say three months, but like I say like past year um, and you can replace it for for $20 or less and in 20 minutes or less. So it, we're saying it's not an heirloom, it's not irreplaceable, but it's something that you could replace in 20 minutes or less for $20 or less, then go ahead and declutter it. And the reason that they say that this rule is so reliable is because you never actually end up replacing it. It's not because you're going to be expected to go buy a bunch of $20 items again. It's because you never actually end up using it. There is something that happens when you get your house highly simplified and decluttered. You don't miss the other stuff. You become highly protective of the people Piece that you have created in your home. And if once in a while you're like, oh shoot, I could have used that. You just, you don't even worry about it and you find something else to use or you borrow it from someone else because you appreciate your house the way it is so much right now that you're not even giving yourself a hard time for getting rid of it because who cares? Like you're, you're getting to enjoy the benefits of having your house so highly simplified. So I fully validate and understand your fear, but I want to encourage you just keep going because you're not going to miss this stuff and it's just going to keep getting better and better. Recently, my my mom passed away and she had collections of items that were very dear to her. I've given away so many of her things. I want to try to recover money from these collectibles, but I can't seem to find the right people or place to sell them. And it's not $50. It's a couple of thousand. Please help. Again, I keep referencing this minimalism masterclass that we did this past weekend, but Zoe Kim is married to Matt Paxton, who wrote the book, Keep the Memories, Lose the Stuff. So for anyone who is going through items that you have inherited, you're helping your parents work through their estate or downsizing, I highly recommend this book. So again, it's called Keep the Memories, Lose the Stuff. We'll link to it in the description. But here's what's interesting. So what Matt said, uh, he made an appearance in our workshop this past weekend, and I hadn't heard him say this before. He said that 
here's what you need to know when you go to sell something, anything, uh, whether it's worth a lot of money or not, you're trying to decide, should I sell it or not, is that your time is worth $20 an hour. So if you have something that you paid $80 for, and it's probably worth $40 or $20 on Marketplace, you have to take into account that you're also then going to spend at least an hour listing the item, going back and forth, meeting the person and whatnot. So that can help us to make the decision of, is it actually worth it? Now you're saying that your these collections are worth a fair amount of money and so that you have decided that it is worth it. And so I would recommend reading that book because within it, he gives different ideas of where you would choose to sell or find places to sell based on various categories of things. So this definitely isn't something that I have a lot of experience with, but within the book, he gives a lot of really good recommendations about different people you could contact or different places that you might go through to be able to sell, sell something that's um, a little bit more unique. Uh, one website that he recommended was Everything But The House. And he said he has had a lot of good luck on there recently. And so, and then also with collections, eBay is another popular choice. Just be sure when you're looking at eBay, if if you're researching the prices for something, what you want to do is you want to look at completed listings or sold listings, not necessarily what everyone has that same item or similar item listed for right now. You want to look at what those items have actually sold for. So you want to filter them and just look at the actual sold prices. And that's going to give you a more realistic idea of what it's worth. So I highly recommend checking out his book. I think it can offer some direction because some of these things are just so unique. And I don't think it's wrong to want to sell things, especially like you said, you you know, donated a lot of other things. There are certain things that it is very worthwhile to sell, but it still can be a little bit daunting. So hopefully that book can offer some helpful resources too. Do you feel like decluttering helps you and especially your children value what you have as compared to before you were minimal? Um, I feel that my children, they're ages five to 15. They sometimes don't seem to place value on things. And I do believe it's because of excess. Oh, yeah, Jocelyn, this is such a good question because, well, I still sometimes think that our kids don't have enough value <laughs> on certain things. So yes, 1000% as we have decluttered and simplified, they, well, here's what I think really happened. What happened was we all started taking better care of our stuff. We all started showing more value for things. And so it was just very natural then that I think the kids started to adopt some of those attitudes too. We were very intentional about what we have in our house. We move stuff out if we're not using it. And so as they began to do that, and as they had a, a much more manageable amount of inventory in their own rooms and spaces, I think it was just this natural consequence then that they valued the things more. You know, when I look back and their toy room had toys everywhere and their bedrooms had clothes and all kinds of stuff on the floor, I was like, well, no wonder they didn't value this stuff because we weren't treating it in a way that you treat things that you value. And so we weren't doing a good job modeling it. We weren't expecting a lot around them. And it was very frustrating when they'd kind of be like, oh, this toy broke. Who cares? Throw it away. I'll just get a new one. And so I very, I, I definitely remember that thinking like, well, what have I done wrong? Because that was not at all my attitude when I was a kid growing up. Like I cherished my toys and I took very good care of them because there was no such thing as just go to the store and get another one or let alone order it on Amazon. So yes, I do feel like as you continue to declutter that that helps. I do think how you model, how you care for your things, how you're selective with what, what you keep, how you move out things when they don't have value. Because the truth is a lot of the stuff that comes in for the kids don't actually have value. There's a lot of toys and things and filler gifts that they get and crafts that they make. And that really doesn't have a lot of value and it should get thrown away or just moved back out again. And so helping them to recognize what, what things do have value, what things do we take good care of and protect and what other things is it okay to just let it go and, and not let it clutter up our space in the first place because it just doesn't actually have that much value. So I think all of this does come become much more clear as we continue to simplify and declutter and definitely in how we model that to our kids as well. I feel that I'm not yet ready to have another baby, but I would like to in the future. I have a selection of baby boy and baby girl clothing. I know I have excess. I have way too much of each, but I also have this niggling voice in the back of my mind that says, keep them, hold on. You're safer when you hold on to them. I am feeling a little bit overwhelmed. I want to keep everything, 
but I don't want to keep everything. <laughs> I think you said that so well. Uh, I think that's the struggle for most women and that aren't quite sure yet if they're going to have another baby. So two ways that you could go about this. One, you have permission. If it right now would just feel good to let everything go, to not have to worry about managing that inventory right now, that is totally fine. I believe that if you do go on to have another baby, that because you've been pursuing simple living, you've been decluttering, you've been learning a lot different mindsets around how much you want to manage. And you probably have an understanding that babies need very little, especially their first year of life. That if you do go then to reacquire the clothing, it'll be for the correct gender for the baby you're having. It'll be for the right seasons. Isn't it amazing how even just the season that a baby is born in makes a huge difference if their siblings' clothes are going to fit and they'll be fresh and they'll be new. Often when we pack away clothes, uh, baby clothes especially, stains reappear, elastic breaks down, uh, even fashions change. And so we often pack stuff away um, imagining we're going to use it all. And I found that I used very little um, from baby to baby of what I had packed away. So you absolutely have permission to just let it go right now. And then when you do have another baby to cross that bridge, bridge to say, I'm just going to reacquire just the few handful of things that I need for the correct season and sizes that they will be during that time. I think there's a lot of freedom in that, especially because I can't quite tell where you live. Um, but where we live, baby clothes and toys are like the easiest thing on earth to come by in most areas. And so the to have to replace a, a few things or to get a, a few new things for a new baby, um, we're not even talking about going to a store and buying brand new, right? For most of us, it wouldn't be that hard to reacquire it. Now, if you're like, that makes sense, but you know, I have some good quality things. I have some favorites that I used with my other children. Then I would say use the container concept. So pick one Rubbermaid container, not even a big one. Let that be your limit for what you're going to keep. And then go through your boxes of baby clothes, pick out your absolute favorites, or maybe a piece that never got worn by another child that you're hoping another baby would. The things that are the most neutral, the most comfortable. It's so funny to look back on the things, you know, like the dressy outfits that I got for our first that I never would have even dreamed about for as you have your fourth. And you're like, they're just going to live in onesies and sleepers and, you know, the most comfortable outfits. And so, Pick out your absolute favorites, the most high quality pieces, the most neutral, put those into your container and then let the other stuff go. And then you do have a small curated collection that you can draw from um, if you do decide to have another baby. But uh, this is one of those areas where sometimes, I, I understand what you're saying, where well, sometimes we think that would give us peace of mind to have extra stuff in storage when actually it's it's just more inventory that we have to manage. It's a burden. We're worrying about something happening to it or, you know, especially if there's any pests or anything where you live. And sometimes it's easier just to let it all go and to have a clean slate uh, when the time comes again. So, and similar philosophy too around baby gear and toys and, and all of that kind of stuff. I think it's really helpful to set a container and only keep what comfortably fits inside. I have a 15 month old and so far she's our only kiddo. Um, I'm constantly trying to keep the toys and books simple, but I am concerned about going overboard since she's so young, she doesn't have siblings to play with and I don't want her to be bored. So I know outside time is a great thing for her, but any suggestions for how to kind of find that happy place with having enough toys to help her with her developmental milestones without going overboard and having a, a chaotic atmosphere for her. Thank you so much. Just enjoyed listening to your most recent uh, episode as I was cleaning up from having friends over, uh, which we were able to do without a lot of stress because the house is so much simpler than it used to be. So thanks for the blessing you've been to our family. Take care. Yay, Hannah. That is so awesome to hear. That's the goal, isn't it? Like, oh, that's just so cool. Well, let me tell you uh, a story from, so Kara helps to everything podcast. So everything to do with this, she helps with, and she has a little guy that is 18 months old. And she's told me that she has very intentionally kept his toys very simple. And even more recently, they've gone further with simplifying them. And she um, makes sure that all of his toys, that he can see them, there's not many, but that they have a clear spot where they can be put away again. And she said the other morning at church, she went to get him from the nursery and the nursery worker said, hey, did you know he was reading some books and then he wanted to go play with the rocking chair and he started walking towards the rocking chair and then he stopped 
And he went back and he put his books away. And then he continued on to go play with the rocking chair. And she was like, is that something that you've been working on at home? Because I wanted you to know, like it's working. And she said, it was so funny because no, that that absolutely is not something that we worked on. But what she's recognized is that since they've really simplified his toys, that he just naturally picks them up when he's done playing with them and puts them back in their spot. And I thought that was just so cool to hear because I think often we set our kids up to fail by how much inventory of toys and things that we surround them by. Kids thrive in highly simplified spaces. I think all kids are minimalist at heart. And I think most kids actually like neat and tidy spaces to live in and to play in and to be in. But when there's too much inventory, like any of us, it just gets overwhelming. And then it's hard to take care of it and to keep it up and to put it away. And so I like to say that we want to match the inventory with the age and stage of our child. So at any age, they should be able to really do most of the putting away and picking up on their own. And, uh, you know, sometimes we jump in to help, but mostly it should be an amount of inventory that they can manage themselves. And for a one year old, two year old, this is actually very low inventory three and four, it's not much, really not till they're like five and six and they manage even a little bit more inventory. But what you're going to find, this sounds very limiting to us because we have grown up in a time where the toy industry is a gazillion dollar industry. There's so much marketing. There are so many toys that are meant to enhance everything, you know, development and intelligence and all of this. But the truth is, if you will just create an environment conducive with imaginative play, your kids are going to get all of the benefits that they need from play for their brains to develop, for their intellect to grow, for their social skills to grow, their emotional regulation. It is fascinating what all happens just through regular everyday play. And you don't have to have any kind of fancy Montessori toys or special toys or anything like that. Just give them a very simple environment where they can play and create. And so I don't think you have to worry too much about going too far with simplifying there's actually been some really interesting studies done in Europe in monastery um, settings where they took out all of the toys and just observed what would happen for a month. The kids had no toys. And it was really fun to read all the creative ways they filled their time and the games they came up with and the imaginative play they did and you know the scenes they would create without any toys at all. And so definitely choose open-ended toys like blocks, duplos, magnetiles, um, those like scarves. Diana just said she got a sensory swing for her kids and they love that. So open-ended toys are great. Very simple craft supplies. You know, for our kids, it's like cardboard, masking tape, and some markers and scissors. We don't do a lot of craft supplies because I don't like cleaning them up and trying to organize them. So you just keep things really simple and you're going to see them thrive and their imaginations come alive. Also, I, I can link to a YouTube video that also helps us as parents learn how to teach our kids to play on their own. There are so many benefits for our kids knowing how to occupy, occupy their own time, whether they're an only child or there's other kids to play with. It shouldn't be unexpected for your child to play for two, three, and four hours a day on their own, if not longer. We were definitely able to achieve that with our kids at all the different ages and stages. So I'm going to link to a YouTube video about that as well, how you can help your kids learn independent play. It is a gift to them. It's really good for them and it's a gift <laughs> to you <laughs> as well. So I will, uh, I'll put a link for it for anything that we mentioned during this video, but I love getting to hear your questions. We'll put the link down below if you want to leave a, a voicemail question as well. It's so fun to hear. I'm so grateful for all of your support. Also, the Take Your House Back course is open. Our next All Day Declutter is coming up the last Saturday here in April. If you have not joined us for an All Day Declutter, it is the most impactful thing that we can do to help you declutter. The amount of decluttering that gets done on that day is off the hook. It is so much. It's so fun to see the before and afters, the huge loads of stuff going to the to donation centers. And so if you're like, you know, I just need like a boost. Like I just need like some kind of pick me up date on the calendar, motivation, guidance. We're there with you the whole time, guiding you, asking questions, um, giving you permission to let things go. It is just so powerful. So that is just uh, $94 right now. It's on sale. We'd love if you can join us. And then that includes the all day declutter, but then the whole full take your house back course, video course as well. There's just so much value <laughs> in all of it. Um, and so I just really want you to get your house decluttered. And if you need to, to invest in something like a course to make it happen, will you please do that? Because it will be the best $94 that you have spent this year. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. Thanks for leaving your questions. I love you. I hope you have a really good day and I'll see you again soon. Thank you for joining 
joining us on the Minimal Mom Podcast. If you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe, leave a review, and share it with a friend who might find value in embracing a simplified life.